CNS and PNS, central nervous system and peripheral nervous system. And the first thing I want to talk to you about are the types of nervous tissue that you would expect to find in these two uh, areas. So first of all, we know um, that a tissue is going to be multiple different cells working together uh, or cell types working together to uh, do something, some common function, right? Uh, and the first type of nervous tissue that we're going to look at is called white matter. And um, white matter essentially is um, going to be all the, the, all the areas within the, the central nervous system and peripheral nervous system that need to just send information. They're not really doing anything themselves. They're just trying to get information from point A to point B. Okay? It's called white matter because it looks white. And the reason why it looks white is because it's heavily myelinated. Right? So it um, looks white due to heavy myelination. Okay, and uh, myelination, uh, the myelin itself doesn't actually require any blood flow. And because it's heavily myelinated here, that means that there's gonna be um, low blood flow, right? So lower blood flow, which is ultimately going to be what's gonna give it its white color um, because it doesn't have any blood flowing through it and therefore um, isn't going to get that sort of brownish red um, tint to it that it would if it had blood flow. Okay, um, We say that white matter is going to act sort of like the connection points uh, between different parts of the nervous system. So it acts as connections between the central nervous system and the sensory and motor neurons. And we know that if it's heavily myelinated, it's generally going to contain um, mostly just uh, glial cells, which are non-neuron cells, and also the axons of neurons. Okay, so it contains... mostly the axons of neurons and glial cells. How can you just contain the axons of neurons and not the rest of the neurons? Because some of the axons are really long. Oh, okay. And so if it's mostly just bundled up axons, then um, it'll just be white matter only. Okay? Um, gray matter. Gray matter basically is anywhere that um, there's there's a uh, integration happening, which is where we process a, a, a signal and then send another signal, right? So it's going to look gray because it's got um, lower myelination in it. Looks gray due to lower myelination. And higher blood flow. Okay. It's going to contain mostly the cell bodies. And because it contains those neuron cell bodies, that's going to allow this to actually go through that process of integration, which means um, taking a signal and then processing it and then sending out uh, uh, another signal for a motor signal. Okay, So it um, is able to integrate sensory signals and send motor signals. 
Okay, so what that means is um, anytime you have the ability to actually do something, uh, it's gonna have gray matter involved, okay? So most of the gray matter is gonna be in your brain. That's, that's where most of the stuff actually happens, most of the processing and stuff like that. But that's not to say that there's not gray matter in other spots. Uh, for instance, like for your knee jerk response, uh, you have gray matter in your spine, right? That's uh, your knee-jerk response is a reflex. And so um, your spine is going to be able to handle that much faster. And so the reason why you have that, I don't know if you know um, about the, the anatomy of your knee, but essentially um, you've got uh, uh, this thing called the patellar tendon here. And uh, the patellar tendon is, is um, going to allow you to sort of move your leg like this, okay? And, and if you were to sort of strike the patellar tendon, See if I can do it with one leg up, right? You strike the patellar tendon, and you get this nice response, knee-jerk response, right? And the reason why you get that in the first place is because it's supposed to stop you from falling down, okay? So if you're walking along through the forest or something like that, and you um, kick a root, okay? And, and that would cause you to trip and fall. Um, your uh, patellar tendon stretches out, and anytime your patellar tendon stretches, that sends the signal to your um, uh, 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 spine, to the, the gray matter in your spine, right? And um, that's a reflex arc, and that sends then the signal back that you should flex your leg out, right? And so by flexing your leg out then, you kick the root, and it causes you to flex your leg out, so when you fall forward, you then step onto the ground instead of falling onto your face, right? And we have to do this, it's beneficial to have this, because uh, if you didn't, then it would have to go to your brain and your brain would be like, oh no, there was a root, we should move our leg out and then it would get sent back down. And most of the time in that case, you would already be flat on your face because that's not a fast enough response, right? Um, this can sort of backfire sometimes if you're in walking up the stairs and you like short a stair a little bit, right? And you don't quite get there. And then you, you kick the stair a little bit, it causes your patellar tendon to flex and you just kick the stair again, but you like still don't get your leg up high enough, you know what I'm talking about, right? And you're like, and you just end up falling. And it's still that same thing, it's just your patellar tendon um, stretching out and your knee jerk response, but it's not actually gonna help you in that case because you're moving upstairs. It turns out evolution didn't really consider stairs uh, when it was uh, evolving this knee jerk response, right? So anyways, that's uh, handled in not your brain, but in um, part of your spine there. But it still is handled by gray matter because it has to be handled by gray matter, okay? Um, let's talk about the brain. So in order to talk about the brain, we are going to draw a really terrible model of the brain up here, okay? So this is going to be... That's going to be um, the main portion of your brain, what's sometimes called the forebrain uh, or the cerebrum, right? And then on the back of your brain, you've also got this other like little lumpy thing here. Okay, that's called the cerebellum, right? Then you've got this other area here that's referred to as the uh, brain stem, right? And then uh, down below that, You've got the spine, the spinal cord. Okay, so basically, um, all organisms are going to have this sort of uh, um, makeup here, where we could sort of define this as saying uh, the forebrain, the midbrain, and the hindbrain. Okay, and so if you go from um, the spine into the hindbrain, then into the midbrain, then into the forebrain, what you would expect is for um, the signals to get increasingly sort of complex and for the function of them to be increasingly complex. So uh, an organism that doesn't have a whole lot of thought process involved will have a fairly small forebrain, right? And maybe, um, you know, all their life processes and stuff would be handled in the hindbrain then. And so that's going to be uh, a, a larger area for them. But for us, we think about a lot of stuff, we do a lot of stuff, and therefore our forebrain or our, um, our cerebrum is going to be significantly larger than the rest of our brain, okay? So we're gonna divide it up, not um, forebrain, midbrain, hindbrain, because there's some weird like uh, 
differences in like if you look at different books and different sources where certain parts get um, attributed. So what we're going to do is we're just going to divide it up into uh, uh, three sections that are like main sections, actually four sections. Okay. So number one, this part here, everyone will agree no matter what source you look at, this is called uh, the cerebrum or sometimes the cerebral cortex. Okay. And the cerebrum's job is to handle all of the uh, sort of voluntary functions. Um, it's going to do something that's called integration, which means you're going to take in information from um, all the sensory uh, nerves and you're going to then uh, go through a motor process and, and um, send back a motor process. Yeah. Uh, maybe. I'm not sure. Transduction just means like uh, a signal traveling. So like... It's, it would be a really general term to use for it. I think the term that's mostly used is integration, um, but it could be similar. It could be the same. Okay. So um, in the cerebrum, this is where you're going to handle voluntary uh, functions. Higher order thinking. Memories, emotions, okay? Basically, all the stuff that you think about your brain doing is gonna happen in the cerebrum, okay? Then, you've got this blue part on the back, okay? It's called the cerebellum, which literally just means tiny brain, okay? So you've got big brain, which is the cerebrum, then you've got tiny brain, which is the cerebellum, and the cerebellum's function, the main function of the cerebellum, is to sort of uh, uh, give you your place in space using um, the inputs from your skeletal muscles and um, your senses. Okay, so it combines senses from skeletal muscle and uh, your five senses to give you <coughs> balance and a place in space, okay? So these things are handled by the cerebellum. Uh, it's actually pretty pretty crazy to think about. Okay, so uh, for instance, like I can sit here and humans. I don't know if you know this about humans, but our um, key sense is our vision, right? We we use our vision more than we use any other sense in our body, and it's sort of the thing that defines us, right? Um, so not all organisms are like that. Vision it tends to sort of take the back seat if you don't have developed eyes, but our eyes tend to be the most important thing. So what I can do right now is I can close my eyes and I've lost now my greatest sense, um, but I can still do a lot of things, okay? So for instance, I can push my chair back, I can put my arms out, I know that my arms are beside me, I can take my chair and I can spin it, right? And I know that um, I'm facing directly away from you right now, and I know that I'm facing towards my chalkboard. I know that over here I've got my uh, computer, and over here I've got my window, right? I can spin all the way back around, and now I know that I'm roughly looking back at you. I don't know how far I spun around, actually. Uh, but I'm pretty sure that I am looking back at you over here. I can reach down and touch my computer, right? I can reach over here and grab my Nalgene bottle, right? And I know that all these things are here because um, my body is integrating all of these uh, 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 sensory inputs that I'm getting from my skeletal muscles. And um, it is uh, also doing things like telling me telling me uh, uh, like, you know, how much my body's moving. So for instance, if somebody like came up and was like trying to play a joke on me and, and was able to move my chair back, I would know that my chair was moving back because uh, my inner ear would sense movement, right? And it does, I don't have to see everything in order for me to then process it, right? Yeah? This is handled by your, uh, your cerebellum. This is like what it does. It's its main function, right? And um, like I said, it's not 
uh, anything that you're really thinking about in any given time, in a daily basis, right? Um, but it's something that just happens, and so it uh, makes sense that um, we're moving up and we're sort of uh, getting more and more complex. Yeah? Right, so if someone is born blind and deaf or something, is that damage to uh, the organ itself or to the cerebellum? Could be. Could be either one. Uh, most likely it's damage to the organs themselves, the sensory organs themselves. But um, the thing that we tend to see is um, the cerebellum develops differently. Um, so for instance, my cerebellum is gonna spend most of its time integrating visual signals with other signals in my body, like skeletal signals and things like that. But somebody who doesn't have any vision is gonna start integrating things like their hearing with their skeletal uh, feedback. Okay, so like you, you get, you know, if you put your hand in front of your face and you close your eyes, you can tell that there's something in front of your face just by the, the um, uh, changes in the way that you hear things. Yeah? Um, was it like, you know, in the windows there and the software there, isn't that also like memory because you know what your room is like? Would that be like the solution? Um, yes. I mean, it's clearly being able to, to uh, reach over and pick up my, uh, my analogy is part of my cerebrum, something that's gonna be handled by you know, a voluntary function, but my ability to sort of sense the area around me and know like where I am in that space still, even though I'm not actively receiving visual signals anymore, is um, handled by uh, the cerebellum, right? All right, then we're gonna look at the brain stem. That's the green part. Okay, and the brain stem is going to give you all your most basic sort of functions, your, your breathing, your heartbeat, um, anything that you really don't consider at all on a daily basis is going to be handled in your brain stem. Okay, so handles all basic uh, body functions. So those are things like breathing. Heartbeat, uh, digestion, all handled in the brain stem for the most part. And then um, I, we're going to talk about a little area on here that we, we didn't really um, look at, but we're also going to cover this one right here. There's a little thing in there, a little space that sort of um, combines the three areas. It's going to um, uh, sort of act as like a, a relay almost. And it's called the thalamus. And I think that uh, most of the time thalamus is considered part of the forebrain, um, but occasionally it's not. Um, so like you can, you can talk about the forebrain as being the thalamus and then the um, cerebrum and the limbic system, right? Um, and so sometimes the thalamus gets grouped up with the cerebrum. It's different based on whatever book you're going to look at, so we're just going to keep consider it separate, okay? But usually part of the forebrain. The thalamus' job is very important for your sanity, and that is it is going to filter out all of the information that you're getting from your senses and sort of give you only the important stuff, okay? So it relays information. from all parts of the brain. While filtering out less important information. Okay. So um, your sensory neurons, for the most part, they don't, um, they don't change whether or not they're gonna send something to your brain. They, they always send the information. Okay? Regardless of what the stimulus is, uh, they don't decide whether or not it's okay to send it to the brain or not. What your brain does is your brain later on decides whether something is important. And there's a really good example of this. I believe that the uh, term for it is the cocktail effect uh, or the, the cocktail party effect or something like that. Right? Um, and essentially, the way that it works is you can be in a very crowded room and you know that if a lot of people are talking in a very crowded room, the um, conversations just turn into like uh, this weird sort of muttering like sound, 
right? You don't you don't hear individual conversations. You just hear like overall this weird sort of conversation sound. You know what I'm talking about, right? Okay. So at any given point, you are able to concentrate on a single person, right? And you can pick out their conversation, right? You can try to tell what they're saying. It becomes easier if you can see their mouth because you can sort of um, figure out what sounds they should be making uh, based on uh, their mouth movements, right? Um, but you sort of block out the rest of that information. Let's say you're talking to somebody and then somebody a few tables over says your name. Maybe it's not your name, maybe they weren't talking about you, but you know, they say Rob or Laura or whatever, right? And so um, your brain says, hey, I think this is important, somebody two tables over just said our name. And so you sort of get that like weird, oh, somebody said my name over there, were they talking to me? No, okay, that's fine, uh, right? But the implications of this are very strange, right? And that is that your brain is hearing every single part of every single conversation that's happening around you at any given point, right? You're just choosing to focus on only one of them, the person that you're talking to, but your brain is actually processing all that information. It's getting all that information, and then your thalamus is saying, not important, not important, focus on the person in front of you, right? And then when information comes around that's uh, not the person in front of you, that you know somebody around you is saying your name, then it says, okay, this might be important, we should check that out, so we'll send it through, okay? There's all kinds of information, this is one example of that, but all kinds of information like this that is constantly being sent to your brain that you don't need to respond to. Right now, you're itchy everywhere. Your, your entire body is itchy, but you're like, I shouldn't worry about that right now because I'm in school and I need to concentrate and write some stuff down, so I'm not gonna worry about my itchiness, okay? Uh, right now, you uh, can feel your clothes like draped on you, right? And, and you have um, sensory neurons, though, that are saying like, hey, look, my clothes are heavy. My, my pants are, are pushing down on my skin. I don't like that, right? But your brain, at any given point, is like, I don't care about that. That's not important. My thalamus is, is filtering it out for me. Right now, your tongue is hitting the sides of your teeth, right? It's, it's like it, it basically doesn't fit in your mouth. And so it's constantly hitting your teeth, and you're like, okay, well, I, it always does this, so I'm not really worried about it right now. But in a general, like, if you start focusing on it, you're like, where does my tongue even go? normally, right? There's no spot in my mouth that it fits because it's constantly hitting my teeth and I hate that, but your, your thalamus is like, don't worry about that. It's really not important right now. We don't, we don't need to worry about that, okay? You can also see the tip of your nose all the time, right? But your thalamus is like, hey, don't worry about that. We don't need to see the tip of our nose. It's not important unless there's like, you know, something on it, like you get like a piece of food on your nose and it's like, hey, you should check that out. That's different than it normally is, but you can always see the tip of your nose, right? You just filter it out in your brain and you don't worry about it, right? So aren't you glad that your thalamus is there, that you're not worried about all these things at any given point? Because you'd go crazy if you did. Um, there are uh, uh, people that have um, sort of less functioning uh, thalamus and, and one of the things that can happen to them is if they're in a situation where it's very loud, uh, it's very easy for them to get overwhelmed by that because instead of their thalamus filtering out all of the different things that are happening around them, they're hearing them all and they're not able to focus on any given one of them and so it can cause them to have uh, anxiety. Uh, uh, it's essentially your, your brain getting overwhelmed by all the different sensory inputs um, because uh, once they get past a certain sort of threshold of severity, if it's, if it's really loud, then your thalamus decides that it's important and should get sent through. But if everybody's being loud, then that can then cause problems, right? All right, so uh, questions over the, the parts of the brain? This is how we're gonna divide them up. This is all you need to know. There's lots of different parts of the, um, uh, we're not done yet, yet though. Uh, there's lots of different parts of the cerebrum, but like you don't need to know the different parts of the cerebrum. You just need to know like the cerebrum exists and it's like the, the end all be all of um, sort of uh, higher level function, okay? So uh, last thing, let's talk about the peripheral nervous system. Peripheral nervous system can get divided up into two different parts. Okay, the first one would be called um, the autonomic nervous system. And the autonomic nervous system is the part of your peripheral nervous system that's gonna respond to all of the involuntary uh, uh, responses that you have. So it responds.
to the involuntary signals from the brain. Okay, so um, generally speaking, the thing that your brain doesn't even consult you with um, are your smooth muscle contractions and cardiac muscle contractions. Smooth muscle is your digestion. You're constantly, uh, your stomach's moving around, your intestines are, are moving your, your food through there. And it's really good that it doesn't need to consult your conscious brain in order to do that because it'd be a real pain if we had to think about digesting things. Imagine if you just forgot for a while and you're like, oh man, I'm dying now because I forgot to digest my food. I wish I would have remembered, right? You'd have to like set a timer to say like, oh, don't, don't forget to digest. Also your cardiac muscle, right? Cardiac muscle is beating all the time. Imagine if you had to control that, it would be a real pain uh, and, and you'd probably just die. Yeah. Is it cardiac or cardiac? Cardiac. AC. Sorry. Okay. Um, also some skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle normally, normally can be controlled, uh, but sometimes it is handled in a way where you do not. So like your breathing, for instance, um, is handled uh, by uh, uh, your, your uh, brain stem for the most part, right? But if you, if you start thinking about your breathing, then you have to control it, right? Because it's a skeletal muscle, and so normally it's handled sort of like as a reflex arc by your brain stem, um, and your diaphragm, like I said, can, can be moved. You can breathe in and breathe out on your own if you want to, right? But for the most part, you don't have to think about it because it's handled in this part of your brain that's called, uh, or, or part of your um, nervous system, rather, that's called the peripheral nervous system, where you don't really have to think about things, okay? Um, that is in contrast to the somatic nervous system, Okay. And the somatic nervous system is going to control all the voluntary functions or respond to all the voluntary functions. Responds to voluntary signals sent by the cerebrum. And the only type of muscle that can respond to that is skeletal muscle. However, is it possible for your cerebrum to control your uh, smooth muscle and cardiac muscle? Sort of, okay? Um, if, you, if your cerebrum causes you to be happy about something or sad about something, um, that can control the release of neurotransmitters and those neurotransmitters can affect the way that um, your smooth muscle and cardiac muscle are going to uh, respond. But for the most part, we would say uh, you can't directly control your smooth muscle, smooth muscle and cardiac muscle that they are controlled in the parts of your brain that you never can, can um, think about and actively uh, do anything about. Questions on the, on the uh, notes? All right, that's it.